Hi, I'm Michael Correer, and this is Psych Exam Review. In the previous video, we considered how the presence of others can influence our performance. But what we didn't consider is that when we're in the presence of others, we often hear their attitudes and we observe their behaviors. And this means we can experience an indirect social pressure to go along with group attitudes or group behaviors. And this is referred to as conformity. Now, one of the earliest studies of conformity was done by Musafer Sharif in the 1930s. And Sharif took advantage of a perceptual illusion called the autokinetic effect. And he used this to investigate conformity because this autokinetic effect is the idea that if you're in a dark room and you look at a small spot of light, the spot of light will appear to move. And how much it moves is subjective. Some people will report that it only moves an inch or two. Others might report it moving as much as a foot. And so what Sharif did was he put participants into groups of three and he wanted to see, do the estimates of other people influence your answers? So if you hear how much other people think the light is moving, do you change your answers over time? And what Sharif found was that participants showed a tendency to change their answers and the group estimates would converge over the course of multiple trials. In other words, some people who initially gave very low estimates, they thought it was moving an inch or two, would increase their estimates. And some people who thought it was moving a foot would gradually reduce their estimates until the group reached a consensus in the middle, even though, of course, the spot of light was not actually moving at all. And what this demonstrates is that hearing the answers of other people was actually influencing the responses of the participants. And this is referred to as informational influence. The idea is that the responses and the behaviors of others actually provide us with information. And that information can be used to guide our decision making. So when we're not sure what the correct answer is, we use the information that we get from hearing other people's answers. Now, one of the most famous studies of conformity was conducted in the 1950s by Solomon Ash. And here's a picture of Ash here. And what Ash did was he asked par participants to match a line length with one of three lines. So in this case here, this would be the stimulus and the participants would be asked to say the number corresponding with that line length. So in this case, the correct answer would be three. Now the participants did this in a room with a group of other participants, but what they didn't know was that these five other participants were actually confederates who were in on the experiment. And on some of the trials, all of these other confederates would unanimously give an incorrect response. And they would be saying their answers as we went along the table, and then it would get to the actual participant. And the question was, would the participants be swayed by hearing these incorrect responses? So in this case here, uh, if this were the stimulus, then the other participants who were actually Confederates might go around and say two, two, two. And then when it got to the participants turn, Ash wondered, would the participants say two or would they say the correct answer of three? And what he found was on these trials where the Confederates intentionally gave the wrong answers, about a third of the time, the participants also gave this incorrect response. So he interviewed participants following the study to find out why did you go along with the group? What was it that made you say the incorrect response? What he found is in some cases, the people actually believed the group. They said, you know, there's five of them and one of me, uh, so I must have been wrong. Maybe I had a poor angle or maybe the lighting was different where I was sitting, or maybe my vision isn't as good as the others. We thought sometimes people actually seem to believe that the group was correct. And this was referred to as private acceptance. But this wasn't the only reason that people conformed. Because sometimes people said, I knew the group was wrong, but I didn't want to disagree with them. I wanted to avoid the tension of disagreement. You know, you're basically telling these other people in the room with you that they're wrong. And they wanted to avoid that. They didn't want to make waves or stand up for what they thought was the correct answer. And so this was referred to as public compliance, where inside their own heads, they knew it was the wrong answer, but they said it to make things easier and avoid disagreement. And this brings us to the idea of what's called normative influence. So it's not just the case that other people provide us with information about the correct answer. They also tell us how we should behave. They establish norms. And those norms tell us how we're supposed to act in a certain situation. In this case, we're supposed to say the answer is two, even though we actually believe it to be three. Now, this normative influence can be easily disrupted. And Ash demonstrated this in another variation of the study where he had what he called a social supporter. And this was one confederate who would break the unanimity of the group and give the correct response. And what Ash found is as soon as one person disagreed with the group, it became much easier for the actual participants to also disagree and conformity dropped. Now, when we think about the 
Ash paradigm for investigating conformity, which has been done in many countries around the world over the course of many decades, we might ask, who cares? Even if we can see that, okay, people conform with the group, what difference does it make? It's not an important task. Right? I mean, it doesn't really matter which line you say. If you say two or three, there's really no effects. And there's very little desire for being accurate. You don't get anything for giving the correct response. Uh, so why wouldn't you just go along with the group? I mean, you don't, it doesn't matter if you give the wrong answer. And it's an artificial situation. I mean, this is something you will never do in your real life. And these are valid criticisms of this approach to investigating conformity. So how can we look at other research that might try to get around these problems? This brings us to a study in 1996 by Robert Baron, Joseph Vandello, and Bethany Brunsman. And what Baron Vandello and Brunsman did was they tried to make a task that was important and where accuracy mattered, where people would want to do a good job. And the task that they used was identifying criminals in a lineup. So the participants would briefly see a photo of a suspect, and then they'd have to pick that person out from a real lineup. And they were given additional incentives to make the task seem even more important and to increase their desire to get the right answer. And the first part of this was they were offered an additional reward for getting a high level of accuracy. So if you get enough of the correct responses, we'll give you an extra $20. And to increase the importance of the task, they were told, this study is gonna be reviewed by law enforcement and it's gonna be looked at by judges who are gonna take this into consideration in their courtrooms and how they use eyewitness evidence. And so please try your best to do a good job. Right? So they increased the sense of importance of the task. And as people gave these answers to the lineup, they could hear the responses of other participants who were actually Confederates, but the order was varied. So the participant was not always answering after everyone else. Sometimes the participant answered first and then those trials didn't really matter. And so what uh, the researchers wanted to see was when the participant answers after the Confederates and the Confederates have intentionally given the wrong answer, how often will they conform? And what they found is similar to Ash's results. They found a rate of about 35% conformity. But then they made the task harder. They thought, what if it's really difficult to identify the suspect in the lineup? And the way that they did this was they showed the photograph very, very briefly. And the people in the lineup were wearing different clothing than in the photographs. So it was very hard to identify the correct person. And what they found is in this case, conformity actually increased. So what does this mean? Well, this suggests that when we have a desire to be accurate and we want to do a good job and we think it's important that we get the correct answer, then this might actually make us more reliant on the informational influence that we're getting from others. In other words, if we really wanna get the right guy and we just heard four other people say that it's guy number three, and we really wanna make sure that we're right, we might actually use that informational influence more than we would if we didn't think the task was as important or if we had gotten a better chance to see the guy in the photograph earlier. Okay, so uh, these are some ways we can investigate the idea of conformity. And in the next video, we'll look at slightly more direct pressures from others around us when we look at compliance and persuasion. I hope you found this helpful. If so, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching.